Welcome to the Ernie Chambers Show. I'm Ernie Chambers, and today I'm going to go through some things by reading and commenting, but that way I might keep myself corralled and on point. This first part is going to come from an article I'd written for the Omaha Star some years ago. As a matter of fact, it was 2004, April 13th, and the headline or title, Rommel and Bush, the second time around. This column is derived in the main from my TV program last Tuesday night, September 17th, 2002. There was a time when on Cox, they had channel two uh, or 22 and I and other black people were given slots and I appeared once a week. Former council member, Ben Gray, uh, governor, not governor, but mayor, Gene Stothard, did not like the things that I said about Omaha's government and lack of leadership, unconcerned for our community, as always happens with governmental agencies. So Ben and Gene got together with Cox and they took the whole thing off the air. So when I mentioned my TV program, that's what's being referred to. From time to time, I've spoken of German General Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, known as the Desert Fox, because of his startling deeds of military acumen with his Africa Corps. I have here a book, Knight's Cross, a Life of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel by David Frazier. It's one of those thick books, the kind I like to read. I was gonna bring it as a prop, but I decided I would just separate my first finger from my thumb and show about how thick it was. It had about 570 pages and I read every one of them. Fascinating, as Mr. Spock of Star Trek would say. If Rommel was a Nazi, I would say Heil Hitler. I could never say God bless America in view of what white American general Dwight David Eisenhower did with reference to segregation and discrimination against black troops. Rommel, although a German, was not a Nazi. In fact, events reached such a turn that he was implicated inappropriately in the 1944 plot to assassinate Hitler under interrogation done of the plotters, one of them mentioned Rommel's name as the possible head of a post-Hitlerian Germany. The man had such stature among the German people that Hitler did not want to pull him into a courtroom and have Rommel opposed by the Fuhrer. So Hitler told Rommel, this is what I offer you, suicide. I'm going to send my generals and you are to take poison. In exchange, your family will be protected. You will be buried with military honors. Your reputation will be saved. Rommel, the good loyal soldier to the end and a strong family man took the deal and the poison. Hitler upheld his end. Why would I bring up Erwin Rommel, the desert fox? Let me read a little something from the dust jacket of this book. Quote, Winston Churchill said, what else matters but beating him? In any numbering of the captains of history, the name of Erwin Rommel must stand in the first rank. He was the outstanding Axis field commander of the Second World War, and was respected, even admired, as well as feared by his opponents. Here, it seemed to the Allies, was a supremely professional soldier, chivalrous, decent, untainted by the crimes of the Nazi regime, carrying out his duty with often dazzling success. Rommel believed that war is a reckless, untidy business and that the habits of mind of a methodical manager are alien to what is required. Instead, Rommel's hallmarks were boldness of maneuvering, 
ferocity in attack, and tenacity in pursuit. This is first and foremost the biography of a soldier, but Rommel reached a position in which he almost inevitably became embroiled in politics. When he realized that the 1944 Allied invasion was going to succeed, he realized also that the only way to save Germany was somehow to negotiate a peace settlement. He tried to present Hitler to whom he had been devoted and who had shown him a particular respect and affection, tried to present Hitler with military realities. He was handed, a he was branded a defeatist and ignored. Rommel was not a flawless heater, leader, but he had that instinct for battle and leadership, which sets him apart, sets him apart from his contemporaries and places him among the great commanders, end of quote. What is the reason that I would write about Rommel? I'll continue. What is there about Rommel that would make a black man such as myself think enough of him to bring him to your attention in this way when this program is aimed at people of color? Well, in 1942, in a 24-hour battle in Africa, Rommel crushed Fortress Tobruk with its ports, stocks, huge numbers of vehicles, and he took 32,000 prisoners. And listen to this. He had quickly settled the first details of the surrender. The South Africans had asked that the considerable number of black prisoners should be segregated from the whites, a request Rommel turned down flatly, saying that the blacks were South African soldiers, had fought alongside whites, worn the same uniform, and were all captives together. There would be no segregation based on race, of prisoners of war where Rommel was concerned. Rommel, the German. First of all, it is remarkable, is it not, that, quote, a considerable number of black soldiers was in the racist South African army. Oh, they don't mind having us in the army, these white people. And we usually take casualties out of all proportion to our numbers there. Continuing, almost as remarkable as the fact that a considerable number of black soldiers was in the racist American army. There would be no segregation of war prisoners when Field Marshal Erwin Rommel was in charge, which was greatly different and a far cry from the way black American soldiers were treated who were guarding white prisoners of war in this country. When they were guarding German and Italian prisoners, the Germans and Italians ate in the white section of the segregated restaurants while the black American soldiers guarding them as prisoners of war were not allowed inside the building. Those who were the soldiers of what was called the Axis forces fighting tooth and nail against these white racist Americans. When some of them were taken captive and brought to this country to be locked up as prisoners of war, black soldiers in uniform of the United States of America were assigned to guard them. But the fact that black men had served as soldiers and served heroically were still victims of the white racism in this still racist country and could not eat in the restaurants where the Italians who fought on the side of the Nazis and the soldiers who were in the Nazi army were allowed to come in and eat. But the black soldiers in the American uniform 
with the American flag on the uniform could not even enter the restaurant. That's why I'd said before, I could not sing ever, God bless America, or say, God bless America, or salute this American flag. Continuing, an old soldier talking on national public radio about his experiences during the war, told how a white Southern cop came and put a pistol to his head. I don't use this kind of language. The cop said, you black bastard, I ought to blow your effing brains out. Don't you ever dare try to come in this restaurant again. The black soldier was in an American uniform. Remember, Rommel, whom some people would call a Nazi, said there would be no segregation of prisoners. In your United States, where united you all stand, where you all sing God bless America, where you all salute the flag, you all worship these white people, the black soldiers and American uniforms guarding white prisoners of war who had fought to destroy this country were treated worse than the prisoners they were guarding. And here is Erwin Rommel, a German, fighting against the troops of the United States and the Allies, fighting against the ones I consider to be the evil ones. It was this Rommel who said, these black men are soldiers like you. They fought as you are fighting. They wear the same uniform. You all are prisoners together and there will be no racial segregation. And he could have added, as occurs among the Americans where they segregate their own black soldiers who wear the same uniform, fight in the same army against the same enemy and are treated worse than the enemies of America who were shooting at these white soldiers. I say again, if Rommel were a Nazi, I would say Heil Hitler, but he wasn't. Rommel was better than the Nazis. He was far better than the Americans. His actions made him a truer and greater exemplification of the fine words in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of this country than any white American ever has been. You all are about to let a crazy white man, George W. Bush, drag your country into a third world war. The racists advising Bush were telling him, let's set up conditions for intrusive weapons inspections in Iraq that we know Saddam will not accept. Then America, will be justified in attacking Iraq and blowing up Saddam Hussein. It is said that Bush the Jr. hated Saddam because Saddam allegedly had wanted to see Bush the Sr. assassinated. That was too much for Bush the Jr. So he launched this war against Iraq. Oil corporations can get at that oil. Bush's father, who was humiliated by Saddam, can be vindicated and George W. can be proclaimed a hero. But Saddam fooled them. He said, quote, we'll let the inspectors into Iraq with no conditions attached. What did Bush's people say? That doesn't make any difference. I watched Bush with his narrow rump self stepping off his helicopter at the White House. He walks, talks, acts, and looks more like Hitler every day. Not only was he rearing back, but he responded to somebody in the crowd by giving that kind of limp wrist salute the way Hitler would do when acknowledging the Heil salute. Yeah, that's what Bush did. You're Hitler. And these sheep, white Americans and some Negroes are going to applaud and support this madman in the White House as he drags this country to destruction. And these things I was saying before the war. 
scoot and skedaddle, scoot and skedaddle. That's who they are. Your president, George Bush, and Vice President Gopher Scoot Cheney and Rabbit Skedaddle Bush. I should tell you how they came by their nicknames, right? Bush earned Rabbit and Skedaddle for the craven cowardly way he fled in terror in Air Force One all over this country on September 11th. Yeah, he got in that plane and stayed off the ground flying around America because he was so frightened by what it might entail for him. Cheney richly deserves Gopher and Scoot because of the way he periodically scoots and tear into his own personal gopher hole and pulls it in behind himself. There you have it, scoot and skedaddle, the twin towers of moral cowardice. Accursed is he that invented war, wrote a young Christopher Marlowe in Tamburlaine the Great. Although Marlowe died at the age of 29, he will live forever through his famous passage. Was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. And that was in his story about Dr. Faust, who sold his soul to the devil. If wars were fought by old men and politicians, they either would not last very long or wouldn't start in the first place. Old men and politicians foment wars, generals oversee wars, innocent young people fight wars and become their tragic casualties. In the heady, giddy, empty-headed propaganda drenched patriotic pre-war days, the populace at large follows along like stupefied sheep, mindlessly bleeding in sync with the war drums thumped by opportunistic politicians and greed-stricken war po uh, profiteers, but when the brainless, super-patriotic warfare fever, fervor dashes itself against the craggy realities of war, you see a change of tune, as happened in Vietnam. When casualties mount up and relatives, friends, and neighbors, and their children have their last breath shot or blown out of them on a bloody battlefield thousands of miles away from home, when the wealthy and political powerful and their offspring escape the rigors of combat and lounge in safety, leisure, and comfort, support for the war will ebb and wane. As hundreds of young casualties grow to thousands, war fervor will evaporate and bitter searching questions will be raised. What is the purpose of the war? Who is profiting from the war? Whose children are bearing the brunt of the war and being shot to ribbons and blown to bits? Why are the children of the people of color again taking casualties out of proportion to their numbers in the population? Support for the war will evaporate like dew before a burning sun. Of course, the national debt, think about what's happening now. And this was written way back in 2004. Of course, the national debt will mushroom as gloom, doubt, and anxiety plunge their sharp edged knives into the fleshy belly of Wall Street, the economy will falter and stagger like a drunkard before sprawling face down in the gutter of depression. War fervor will be elbowed roughly aside by a raucous, vociferous anti-war fervor stemming not from any profound moral principle, but rather from an anti-US casualty sentiment. As long as America is doing the killing, let the war go on. Dropping bombs from thousands of feet in the air, launching missiles from the sea hundreds of miles away, killing, innocent men, women, and babies. Americans love that. Large-scale protests can be expected to erupt. 
Politicians will panic as the Vietnam example looms larger above the horizon of the past and draws ever nearer. Political backing for the war will weaken, erode, and begin rapidly fragmenting along partisan fault lines. The profiteers will be chirping merrily like a chorus of robins, though, because they make money from the war. That's all I'll read from that. But it indicates that history does not necessarily repeat itself, but human beings don't seem to learn from the mistakes of the past. White people will let themselves be dragged in to all kinds of mischief by racist white leaders who hate white people, along with black people, if those white people get in their way. I have told people down through the years that the racists will sharpen their weapons of oppression against us because white people will not say anything about it, joining in the happiness at seeing black people suffer. But these white men are looking beyond black people. We are the means by which they sharpen their tools of oppression, as I said, how to deprive people of their rights before the courts, how to take away defenses they may have against governmental intrusion, and white people will sit and watch Happy that it happens to us, not knowing that they are the real target, because they have the numbers and they are the ones who are going to have to be taken care of in terms of opposition. So when the drop falls and some white people start being treated the way we get treated all the time, suddenly they put up a pitiful mouth and yelp and say, this is not what America is supposed to be. Well, it's what America has always been to us, and it has been worse. But let me go over some things in addition to what I have about the way black men and women in the military get treated. I had read from this article before here, but some things bear repeating. When you go to church, how many times has it been that you heard the same sermon preached under a different title, the same verses read from the Bible, the same songs, everything the same over and over and over. As Lloyd Price might have said, oh, oh, over and over. That's the way church is. And when I went, there was a lady named Sister Essie Bradford, and she did know the Bible. And if a preacher gave a verse, she would give the next one or finish his. For example, if the preacher said, the Lord is my shepherd, she before when he took a breath, before he could get out his words, she said, and I shall not want. Well, the people who went to the church knew Sister Essie, and they knew how she finished sentences and would quote verses before the preacher could get them out. But when one of these hucksters, one of these buck hustling, dishonest, hypocritical preachers came to run what they called a revival, they were taken aback and pushed off their stride when they were ready to make their dramatic, ending, and Sister Essie Bradford took it away from them by taking the words right out of their mouth. Well, if the same thing can be repeated in church every day, and if among the Catholics, the same thing can be repeated over and over and over at one sitting, then I can read those things that are of significance. On Sunday nights on the radio, they used to have the Catholic Hour. And I learned things they said, and they'd say it over and over. Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou amongst women, blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for sinners now at the hour of our death, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art, and on and on and on. And if you did something wrong, the priest would let you off by saying, give us 10 Hail Marys and three Our Fathers. And that's what white people offer us. 10 Hail Marys, Three Our Fathers, now get on your way and be good little boys and girls. And that's what a lot of Black people do. This is from the Washington Post, 2006. Notes illuminate Churchill debates. The British leader disliked America's segregation of Black troops. Rommel did too. And Rommel would not let the South Africans have their wish of segregating black South African soldiers from white South African soldiers and black South Africans should not even have even been 
and the racist South African army. But I understand why, just like I understand why Black people in America fought in every war this country had, because they'd be promised freedom. And the promise, unlike what Lincoln said, the promise being made must be kept. It hasn't been kept to this day. Right now, you have a petition being circulated in Nebraska to put into the Constitution the framework for voter identification. If the right to vote is the cardinal constitutional right of the people, because it's supposed to be a government of, by, and for the people, and voting is how people express their wish, why would these white racists, notably the Republicans, want to put conditions on voting that they know will hurt Black people? They know the long hours that we work, that we sometimes can't even get off work until the polls will close if they close them early. In some states, they even allowed voting on Sunday. What they would like to do is say that if the lines are very long as they are in Black neighborhoods, and poor white neighborhoods too, by the way, nobody can offer those people water or refreshments who are waiting to vote. That would be a violation of the law, trying unlawfully to influence people. But these racist devils, the white people with the blue eyes, know good and well that these people who offer bread and water and maybe other sustenance are not trying to influence those people to vote because they don't know how they're going to vote. They're being the good Samaritan. They're thinking of what Jesus said, when I was thirsty, you gave me not to drink. When I gave, was hungry, you gave me no bread to eat. So these racists all over the country and Nebraska are doing what they can to take away the right to vote of black people. And it will hurt some poor white people too, and older people. But that's America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, as they call it. That's crazy. Who is free? Certainly not me. Who is brave? We not only are brave, we are foolhardy in fighting to defend this country, standing up for the principles that supposedly rule this country more determinedly and faithfully than the ones who hypocritically put those things in the Constitution. On that, let me digress. This is what teachers do. When they think a point should be made and an opportunity comes to make it, they'll make it. Some people, when they get on the Supreme Court, usually the racist will say, I am a literalist. I am one who goes by the words of the Constitution. Well, not a long time after the Constitution was put in place, there was a chief justice whose name has become almost synonymous with the U.S. Supreme Court, John Marshall. He was the one who made it clear that the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says that it is. And he was the one who led the way in the Supreme Court striking down various enactments of Congress because they violated the Constitution as interpreted by the judges. Now, how can these judges be so arrogant and judges of today follow that? John Marshall explained, constitutions are the basic law, the organic law, the fundamental law of a nation. The constitution is written to exist, not just for now, but for generations and maybe for as long as that country exists. Such being the case, the words of the constitution must be interpreted to adapt to changing circumstances as the nation ages and things change. Therefore, the judges of the Supreme Court will not go literally by what the Constitution says because it would not apply to today. How could anything written in the Constitution, you all ought to read it, deal with segregated schools, deal with public education, deal with superhighways, Interstate Congress, commerce, 
airplanes, trains, boats of the kind never seen. The only way the Constitution can be a viable document is to make it what that word viable means. It lives, it grows, it adapts, and that process is presided over by the nine judges of the U.S. Supreme Court. Now you all have a lesson, and you understand you should now why it's impossible to just read the words of the Constitution and say that's exactly what it means. But when it comes to voting and some of those substantive rights, what a vote is does not change. And the Constitution guarantees every state a Republican form of government, not Republican like the GOP, grand old, I won't say what that P stands for in these days. What the word Republican meant when it was applied to government is representative government. A democracy means government by the people themselves. The people have never been the government. They vote and send representatives. A representative government is a Republican form of government. The word democracy does not appear anywhere in the Constitution. And yet people say this is a democracy. No, it's not. The schools teach that which is not true. And yet these people who are against what they call critical race theory say that some things that are taught in schools make little white kids feel bad and they should no longer be taught, such as slavery and the things that really happened in this country, the way black women were raped, mutilated, by these white so-called fathers of this country called Christian men, but they were hypocrites because they were slaveholders. They were married, believe one man and one woman should marry, but they were adulterers because they frequently, constantly and regularly had sex with black female slaves. That's what this country was about. It's been an immoral cesspool from the very beginning. And the ones who spoke the most high sounding words were the worst offenders. But let me go back to what I was talking about. These notes on Churchill debates were finally released to the public. The declassified notes taken by Deputy Cabinet Secretary Norman Brook provide the first unfiltered look at debates among Churchill and his cabinet members on key issues at the height of World War II. Previously released minutes of cabinet meetings have described discussions in general terms without providing details of the debates on certain matters. The documents made public at the National Archives also showed Churchill decreed that Britain must not interfere with racial discrimination practices in the World War II era US military. Churchill didn't like it. Rommel didn't like it. But the white Christian Democratic Americans insisted on it. At the time, black soldiers in the British Army were treated equally the way that Rommel said black and white prisoners of war should be treated. They wear the same uniform, they're in the same army, they should be treated the same. While black and white US soldiers ate and slept in separate areas. The documents show that Churchill and other ministers took a dim view of US prejudices, but did not want the issue to cause friction between the allies. America is not the greatest country in the world. They have been the most powerful because they stole land from the native people in this, on this continent where there were resources that allowed them to amass wealth, not from their industry, not from their honest work, but they stole the land. Then they kidnapped people, brought them across the Atlantic Ocean as slaves, treated them worse than livestock. And these slaves worked and enriched these white racist devils. That's how America got to the position of preeminence that it has in the world. It first stole the land. It enslaved workers, created weaponry that gave them more kill power. 
because they had more with which to make these things. And that's how they came to dominate the world, not moral light, as they want to indicate, like a city set up on a hill. But to finish, in October of 1942, this is a war time. Churchill told the cabinet that US views must be considered. The cabinet agreed to instruct military leaders to respect US policies without allowing them to influence British practices but it did advise that British troops should show a great deal of reserve when dealing with black US troops. What the black people in the military would have been better off with was Urban Rommel, the German field marshal who felt that a soldier is a soldier is a soldier. Now, I served in the military, and here I read this once, I believe. November 5th, 1959, Company D, 1st Battle Group, 1st Brigade, REA training, Fort Ord, California, where I was taking my advanced basic training in the U.S. Army Infantry. It's to the commanding officer, Company E, 2nd Battalion, 355th Infantry Regiment. On September 15, 1959, Private Ernest W. Chambers joined this company to complete his second eight weeks of infantry training. From the first day of training, he has proven himself to be an outstanding soldier. This soldier has constantly demonstrated outstanding character. He has demonstrated a willingness to learn and to get the job done, which is in keeping with the highest standards of military service. During his second eight weeks of infantry training, this company has been extremely fortunate to be able to have a soldier of private chambers caliber. And as graduation time comes along, we are indeed sorry to see this young man leave, but at the same time, very happy to have had him with us. It is a well-known fact in this company that when Private Chambers does something, he gives 100% of his mental and physical energies. This attitude toward military life is indeed most commendable. I highly recommend promotion for this soldier. I would do it myself, but regulations prohibited. Marshal A. Burdick, Captain, Infantry, Commanding. Whenever I undertake to do something, I do it the best that I can, as they found out in the legislature which is a place that where there are racists and racism. And I learned their rules and I did the job there the best that I could. And it made me what white people call a legend. My enemies, because I did the job that a member of that white legislature was supposed to do better than the white people whose legislature it was. I set an example that has been unmatched. And that's the way I was written about. I've got the articles. You know why I kept them? Because white people like to say, it's not so, it couldn't have been that way. There is a bitterness that any black person has toward what this country has done to us and our people. A lot of us lose our way. A lot of us become disheartened, discouraged, disillusioned, defeated, and cannot survive and take the way out that seems to be better. Alcohol, drugs, and even suicide. And some of us have watched these things happen to people that we know. And we know that had they not been kept locked up in a ghetto, denied opportunities to just be a human being, they would not have perished in the way that they did. When I was going to Creighton, right across the street, on the corner, it was on the southeast corner of 24th and California, was a little restaurant where they would not serve black students. 
unless that student was with a bunch of white people who would insist that the black student be served. And when you picked up the menu, you would see the words, and this was on all the menus of all the white restaurants. We reserve the right to deny service to whomever we choose. And that was to give a message to black people. That's what we went through. And that's during my lifetime. And I read all the time. I read the books written by white people, books that document what was written at the time it was occurring in the early days of this country. Thomas Jefferson put together a document called Notes on Virginia. He was having sex with a 14 year old girl, Sally Hemings. What would that be called today? Rape, statutory rape, Thomas Jefferson. And he had a wife. So he was a child molester, a rapist, and an adulterer. And yet when we're in school with black children, we're taught to honor Thomas Jefferson and so are white kids. And this that I'm telling you is what these white people who are opposed to what they call critical race theory don't want taught because it makes little white children feel bad. How about little black children to whose people these things were done? There's a book written called The Port Chicago Mutiny by R.T.L. Allen. It's the story of the largest mass mutiny trial in US Naval history. And guess who were the ones put on trial? Port Chicago was not in Chicago. This is from the beginning of the book. On July 17, 1944, an explosion with a force equal to that of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima nearly leveled the California town of Port Chicago. Two military cargo ships loaded with ammunition and the entire Port Chicago waterfront were vaporized by the blast and literally disappeared from the face of the earth. 320 men lost their lives. 202 of them were black. Out of the 320, more than two thirds were black handling this volatile cargo. It was the worst home front disaster of World War II. But another tragedy followed when black seamen refused to return to loading ammunition under the same unsafe conditions that had sparked the explosion, 50 of them were charged, not with disobeying an order, but with mutiny punishable by death. What followed was one of America's worst miscarriages of justice, the largest mass trial in naval history, and a stunning story of racial prejudice and national disgrace told for the first time only now. And this book was just recently written. And this is just kind of a summary. In the fall of 1944, a young lawyer working for the NAACP went to California to defend 50 black seamen accused of mutiny. The attorney later became a US Supreme Court justice and his name was Thurgood Marshall. The men were black sailors and heroes. They were the survivors of the worst domestic domestic disaster of the war, the explosion of Port Chicago, California that claimed 320 lives. Now the Navy branded these men as cowards and criminals. Was there really a mutiny at Port Chicago? What caused the terrifying explosion? Was racial prejudice behind the indictments? Who was ultimately responsible for the disaster and the shocking trial? The provocative account provides stunning answers to these questions and rewrites a vital chapter in American history with the pen of truth. In the summer of 1944, thousands of tons of ammunition were loaded into Liberty ships at a tiny California port near San Francisco. All the seamen who actually handled the ammunition, all of them were black. All the officers were white. The seamen had been given technical training to serve at sea. None were instructed in the handling of ammunition. 
all were told the bombs could not explode because they had been defused. But complaints about the dangerous conditions were made regularly to Navy higher ups. The only response was the demand that increased tonnage be loaded in shorter and shorter periods of time. One of the men who had complained was an intelligent, clean cut black seaman from New Jersey named Joseph Small. He was a winch operator, a position for which he received no training and which required tremendous skill. He was off duty and back at the barracks on the night of July 17, 1944. Two ships, the E.A. Bryan and the Quinault Victory were being loaded by floodlight. Their cargo included 650 pound incendiary bombs with the fuses already installed. It was particularly dangerous, hot cargo. Shortly after 10 p.m., an explosion blew Joseph Small out of bed and the barracks collapsed around him. The small town of Port Chicago, a mile and a half from the docks, was nearly razed to the ground. The two ships and their docks simply vanished. The dead totaled 320,202, oh, 320, 202 of them black men. This single stunning disaster accounted for more than 15% of all black naval casualties during the war. A few weeks later, after denying the serving black seamen the 30 day leave granted to the white survivors, the Navy ordered them to return to work at a nearby port under the same unsafe conditions found at Port Chicago. Over 200 black men refused to march to the docks 50 were singled out for court-martial on a charge of mutiny. Joseph Small was identified as their ringleader. If found guilty, they could be sentenced to death. And so began the trial called the Port Chicago Mutiny. Oh, for a German field marshal named Erwin Rommel. Robert L. Allen's stirring courtroom drama and portrayal of the disaster itself is based on actual trial documents, material recently declassified by the Navy, and interviews with key black seamen who have borne the injustice of the Port Chicago mutiny for over 40 years. Their own words, along with a colorful, intimate diary account written by Joseph Small, are moving testaments to the personal sufferings of what Thurgood Marshall called, quote, one of the worst frame-ups we have come across, unquote. The shame of Port Chicago aroused the passions of Eleanor Roosevelt and reporter Mary Lindsay and the grave concerns of Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal and Franklin Delano Roosevelt himself. It is a story told now to acknowledge the sacrifice of all those brave black men who died at Port Chicago and to remove the stigma of disgrace from 50 brave, decent black men who deserve, even at this late hour, the nation's admiration and the restoration of their good names. Robert L. Allen, who holds a PhD degree in sociology from the University of California, San Francisco, has both observed and actively participated in the civil rights and anti-war movements. For 11 years, he was an editor of the Black Scholar magazine. He also taught sociology and ethnic studies at San Jose State University and Mills College in Oakland, and is the author of Black Awakening in Capitalist America and Reluctant Reformers, Racism and American Social Reform Movements. Now, that's just some of what actually occurred. And there's a lot more. And when you become aware of these things, it's amazing that people like me retain our sanity that don't take up a semi-automatic weapon and go into a crowded place of white people and kill everything moving. Set a bomb and blow up a white church where little girls are killed also. Go into a church 
of white people having Bible study and pretend that we want to join and have our soul saved. And those white people open their hearts and their arms and their church to us. And I, being one of the ones that I'm describing, would come in and with a gun, shoot nine of them to death at their Bible study. This is what a white man did in a black church. Homes bombed, churches destroyed, black men lynched, wearing the United States military uniform, and those racists in the legislature wanted to pretend they didn't understand why I have the attitude that I have, and some Black people pretend or are so ignorant of our history that they don't understand why I retain the attitude that I have, where I'm not going to take low, I'm not going to bite my tongue. Every time I become aware of a wrongdoing judge, I will file a complaint. And the complaint I filed against the judge who refused to approve the adoption of the same-sex white couple, that complaint was dismissed by the Judicial Qualifications Commission saying that this judge in violating the law did nothing that violated the code of judicial conduct by making negative comments that were disparaging and dehumanizing to those two women did not do anything that violated the code of, of judicial conduct. So I'm preparing a treatise that I'm going to deliver to the Judicial Qualifications Commission and release to the media. And the law says, the Constitution says it, the state statute says it, that all proceedings before or in connection with the complaint to that commission are confidential. I got a letter which had two sentences that the judge did nothing that violated any provision of the code. And I'm going to specify the ones that, that he did violate. And the second sentence, pursuant to Nebraska law, these proceedings are confidential. I don't care about that word confidential. It's not going to make me be quiet. I'm going to say what I've got to say. I'm going to write what I call a treatise. And I'm going to point out how hypocritical these white people are. Because although the Nebraska Supreme Court reversed what this racist judge did, based on what the Judicial Qualifications Commission said in dismissing my complaint, that he violated none of their provisions, he can do the same thing again. They have now certified and authorized him to do the same thing again because it violated no provision of the code. They don't reckon somebody like me who has read the code more carefully than they have. And my document is gonna go on for pages and pages and pages. Maybe nobody will read it, but it's something that I have to do. And I've always done what I have to do because like Popeye, I am what I am and that's all that I am. Right now, I'm going to terminate this because my time is up. And as the commissary said, when he was told that the doors to his cage was open, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.